to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. We're back with episode 76 of the Leo Training Podcast. And this week, I sit down with double world championship silver medalist from Great Britain Rowing, Dr. Cameron Nickel. He's also the founder of Rowing Wad. Rowing Wad is centered around the idea that every person is an athlete and every athlete should row. We hit on a lot of key areas from programming and training at the elite level of rowing to his work in founding his own business with Rowing Wad to his work as a medical doctor and how he hopes to change health and fitness across the world. So without further ado, let's roll to episode 76 with Dr. Cameron Nickel, Rowing Wad. Dr. Cameron Nickel, welcome to the Leo Training Podcast. I'm very excited to have you on. Uh, we've had this one in the works for, for quite a bit, so uh, I'm glad we finally got to connect and we're both kind of uh, doing so over a respective holiday weekend. So thanks for taking the time to do that out of your extremely busy schedule. No, my, my pleasure. pleasure. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me. me. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. We've got uh, a great episode in store. Um, you've got some tremendous experience um, as a you know high performance athlete, and then you're doing some fantastic stuff in the health and fitness community now. Um, and you've got quite a unique background. Uh, so your perspective, uh, I think, is going to be be able to provide some very intangible advice uh, to the audience. Um, so why don't we start there and why don't you kick things off and, and kind of tell them who is uh, Dr. Cameron Nickel, where you're located, and uh, your background. Yeah, I mean, very, very, not, very kind. Um, I, I just like to think of myself as Cam. Um, I'm, I'm just a guy, I think, that likes to pursue opportunities and that gets excited by new things. Um, and whenever these things arise, I tend to just work hard to try and make them happen. So um, I guess, yeah, officially I, I'm a medical doctor. I... I'm a coach as well. I used to be an Olympic athlete and was in the national rowing team for an Olympiad over in the Great Britain rowing team. I have juggled many different things throughout all those phases in my life. I still keep myself fit and I like doing all sorts of different bits of training. I use CrossFit as a methodology most often in my life now. I still row. I um, row with a bunch of old boy Olympians. Um, and we race, which is great. So I would sort of say that I'm a I'm a doctor. I'm a former Olympic athlete. I'm a coach, um, and I've started my own business with with rowing wall. So I guess that makes me an entrepreneur as well. But <laughs> yeah, but, but but really, what I what I do is I think to put it simply is just um, work hard to pursue things that excite me, and just try and have fun along the way. Yeah, that, you know if uh, if you're ticking those last couple boxes off. You know, life's pretty good. You're you're living some pretty fulfilled days. Exactly. That's yeah. why I like to do it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so you, uh, as you just kind of shared, extremely busy. Um, your your schedule is is pretty much at full tilt. <laughs> uh, yeah. All the time. So, um, why don't you share a little bit about um your your medical education uh, background yeah. and what you're kind of concentrating in, and then. I think it would also be uh, great from a context perspective to kind of share when you started to per pursue medical school, um, kind of when that was, if you were also training yeah. during your time on the GB team. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I, I think it was about the age of 16, 17, I decided that medicine was a career that I wanted to pursue. Um, I was always fascinated with the human body. Um, I was naturally a people person, so I loved meeting new people. I liked problem solving. Um, and I had done a lot of different, um, things to see if medicine was the right career for me. So I did a bit of shadowing in a few different hospitals. I went out to explore the more human side of medicine in orphanages in Romania. I went to go and look at different sports teams and see the medical teams uh, that supported them. So I did all sorts of things to try to figure out, was this the right career path that I wanted to start to go down? And all those boxes came back as, yeah, I think I do. Uh, I think I do want to become a doctor. 
so I, I applied and I arrived at medical school in London, um, at University College London. And I realized pretty quickly that medicine was full on and it was quite an aggressive schedule. And if I didn't do something to complement or to just get out of that intense, competitive, academic space, that I would struggle, I think. And one of my other big passions is sport and movement and, and fitness. And I did you know, lots of different sports at school, but one of them that I really loved was basketball. Um, ironically, I tried to find a basketball club that I could combine with my medical studies. And I realized that there just wasn't because there's too much commitment required for the basketball teams. Um, so I found rowing completely coincidentally at University College London Medical School. And I went down to the Thames, which is the iconic river through the heart of London, to where the boat race is run every year between Oxford and Cambridge. And there was something quite special about having a 30 minute train ride from my medical school to get on the water and be out um, with all these boats and in this kind of unique, majestic environment. Um, so I fell in love with the sport pretty quickly. And I started to, I picked up my first oar when I was 18 at medical school in about 2005, 2006. And I slowly got into it in the sense that I was doing it twice a week and I was working hard at medical school. And the sort of catalyst moment for me that fueled a, a significant proportion of my life was that someone had told me that the London Olympics were only six years away. And if I trained pretty hard, then um, there's a good chance I could get to go there. And so that for me was where the seed was planted, which was at the University of London Boat Club. Um, and I guess they say the sort of the rest is history. And I essentially sacrificed almost everything to ensure that that goal happened um i trained very hard around my medical school hours sometimes too hard and i sort of paid for that with with lack of sleep and i started to progress through the great britain setup quite quickly um 18 months after picking up an oar i had a great britain under 23 vest on 18 months after that i'd been invited to go and train with the olympic squad after beijing and then fast forward four years, I'd had a, a pretty successful Olympiad and I'd won a couple of world championship silver medals in the men's eight and then was selected into Team GB as part of um, part of that team for the London Olympics. So so it was all a bit of a, a whistle or a whirlwind tour. Um, and I guess medicine has always been the, the backbone and the, the structure that I've always pursued these other goals from and had to juggle them um, with. So so that was my kind of medical training effectively is that I started at UCL and did slow track medicine towards the end of my degree whilst I juggled my Olympic rowing training. Um, but then I've gone on from there to do my foundation training now and and I'd like to pursue a career in, in sports and exercise medicine, um, essentially focusing on two things. The first is, as, as the name suggests, you know, the sports side of things and the performance. But the thing that really excites me is the is the exercise medicine and helping to combat non communicable and lifestyle diseases. So yeah. yeah, that's a nice umbrella of of my kind of medical focus and it starts to give a bit of a flavour as to how I've combined things in my um in my athletic and medical career. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really cool. Thank you so much for for uh, sharing your your. Uh, your path uh, all the way through med school and then uh, your time on the GB team and everything and working your way up through the ranks and stuff. That's, that's pretty unbelievable how you just kind of, you know, found the sport, uh, picked it up and, and very quickly uh, took to it and had some, some great success. Yeah. Well, I think rowing is one of those sports where it's, I mean, comparative, I hate saying this because it makes it sound so easy, but it's quite, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite, it's quite a low skill sport. So um, compared to something like tennis or golf, it's comparatively low skill, um, but it is very, very high physiological demand on going fast. So there's, there's no two ways about it. You can be the most skillful rower in the world, but if you're five foot five and you weigh 50 kilos, you're unlikely to win an Olympic gold medal. It's just, that's just the way the sport works. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was fortunate in the sense that I'm, you know, six and a half feet tall, weigh 100 kilos and I've got a big wingspan. So I have the anthropometrics to be fast in the boat. And I was identified quite early on by GB Rowing, who do a great job of identifying what I would call athletes with the raw materials to be fast. And they look high and low across the country and with lots of different projects and lots of different schemes um, to ensure that we produce the next generation of Olympians and Olympic champions. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really I was in the right place at the right time and worked hard enough to enable those things to come off. Um, but I had a lot of support and help along the way. Yeah, fantastic. 
Fantastic. It's it, it's interesting to hear you say that that uh, you you feel lo- uh, rowing is a is a low skill sport compared to to golf or tennis. I actually I, I kind of think of it as a different way because you're on a body of water in a boat, and depending on you know that body of water, you have current or wind. Uh, mm. the, the the sort of environment you're quote unquote playing on is is could be dynamically changing underneath of you, whereas at least with tennis and golf, you're, you know, you're on solid ground. You're, you know, where your feet are planted. Um, you know, it's the, those kind yeah. of variables that, that are out of control. It's just, it was, a, it was more, uh, an observation hearing from somebody. Yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hmm, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I guess I just always think of it as low skill because I'm comparing the top of the world. I think sure. it's very, it's very, un, it's, 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 but no, no, as in, sorry, don't, don't me sound like I don't know, cantankerous, but it's it, when you compare Olympic champions and the likes of Tiger Woods, Roger Federer, right. you know, Justin Rose, Rory McIlroy, um, Serena Williams, and all the people that have come from a, they're at the top of their game in those sports, the, the pathway seems to be start at, you know, age three, four, five, six, and then you develop the skills throughout. Um, with rowing, you do get people that start quite young um, in the sense that you do get 14, 15, 16-year-olds starting the sport. That's quite young for rowing because of the physiological demands it puts on the body. We tend to start people a little bit later. Um, but you do also get these stories of people starting a sport quite late and progressing through the ranks quite quickly. And, you know, the name Helen Glover comes to mind. She was actually the same school as me, and she was in the Great Britain rowing team. Um she went on to, to win two Olympic gold medals, so one in London and then one in Rio. And, and she started rowing almost just the Olympiad before London. So within sort of four years, she'd gone from a complete novice to the world's best um, bow side wow. pair rower. So I just don't think that happens in golf or tennis. Um, you, you can't just pick up a tennis racket at the age of 18 and then at the age of 22 win Wimbledon. Um, so that's how I think about the sport. Yeah. In the same breath, you're completely correct. I mean, People on the machine, you know, it's it's quite a complicated movement to get right because it's quite unnatural. But try and think about putting a machine onto two sort of BOSU balls, one on the front, one on the back. Then wire that machine up to seven other people or three other people. Then put it on the water, which is another unstable. Like, and then throw some wind and rain and, and then say, go racing. <laughs> you know, then it becomes quite complicated. And, and yes, there is a huge skill factor to going fast. Absolutely. Yeah. No, excellent, excellent points. Yeah, it was it was uh, very cool to kind of hear your uh, your your thoughts on that. Um, and to kind of circle back to some of the other uh, response you had in regards to your. Uh, what you're going to focus on uh, with your medical education and uh, your practice, the sports and exercise medicine. I think that's fantastic. So it sounds like you are going to, if I'm, if I'm understanding your response correctly, uh, kind of really using exercise uh, to help drive, you know, health and lifestyle and behavior change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think putting it simply, the the majority of the world at the moment are suffering from diseases that are largely caused by lifestyle. Um, we're eating the wrong things and not moving, you know, I- enough. And these things can be preventable. So the things like you've heard all before, type two diabetes, ischemic heart disease, you know, all of these things that kind of contribute to what we call like a metabolic syndrome. They're essentially, in, in my mind anyway, a victim of, of consumer advertising where we love to eat sugar and we love to you know, sit at home and have all these gadgets that do everything for us. But really, I think as human beings, we haven't biologically evolved for a number of years. You know, we, we're the same beasts that we were 10,000 years ago. It's just that now the environment has changed massively. Um, there's a really good book, actually, a guy called Daniel Lieberman. Um, I think it's called something like the story of the human body. Very, very eloquent description of, of that essentially coming with these sort of evolutionary mismatch diseases where our biology hasn't changed, but the environment has changed so drastically that our bi- biology can't cope with it. You know, so a very helpful mechanism is to store fat from 
carbohydrate consumption or store fat from excess calories because food is scarce in the environment we lived in 10,000 years ago and so it's quite helpful to live off that energy when you've got a bit of fat stores if if you know you're not going to get an antelope that runs by for another week or so <laughs> but but now you know now we can go down to Mackie D's or the supermarket um we still have that mechanism to store energy and store fat um but we're storing it so much as a population um that we end up getting type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome and having and shortening our life expectancies. So for me, what excites me most is bringing movement and bringing the knowledge to the public to change health and to change health for the better. Um, and I, I really get excited about helping people fulfill, uh, helping people pursue and fulfill sort of happier and healthier lives. And I think that we need to, as a, as a, I would call it as a health industry and also as a fitness industry get that knowledge and get that behavioral change out there otherwise health systems just won't be able to cope fact um and so yeah that's what i'd like to spend my career doing that's that's awesome that's uh that's quite the the mission but it's a uh it's a fantastic one yeah. and very cool very very cool yeah and i and I, you. you're welcome yeah i like the um the kind of engine that you're driving uh underneath of that is it's all uh proactive approach um you know and and uh i i you know i think many people may argue that medicine uh at least in the u.s can typically be very reactive you know you go to the doctor when you get sick or yeah. you know when something happens rather than people don't think of the food that you consume or the exercise that you do the activities that you do as you know medicine but but you know, they very well can be. Absolutely. And it, 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 I mean, as human beings, we, re, we, we react to feedback, you know. So if the feedback every day was that we're eating all this crap and we're not moving well and <laughs> yeah. we started to get more and more tired and we started to feel really bad, like we were probably changing things pretty quickly. But the thing is, it's so the, – the, the feedback is so gradual. We're so good at, at, with the human body adapting is that we don't really get proper feedback or a wake-up call until you take a random fasting blood sugar at the doctors and they go, oh, you got diabetes. Or you think, oh, I've got some central crushing chest pain that radiates my left arm. Oh, man, I've had a heart attack. Like it, it, Those are the big wake-up calls where sometimes it takes that for people to realize that lifestyle change needs to happen. Right. Um, but in my head, what, what a lot of happens at my um, – in my thought process in the world of medicine is that there's a lot to be learned from the athletic world um, in the sense that athletes don't just train incorrectly with lots of instability and lots of sort of inferior training methods and then one day have a career ending catastrophic injury. There's a constant process of understanding what is the movement that my sport or the demands, how can I first ensure that performance is as high as possible. But the second thing is how can I, prehab myself to ensure that i am not picking up any significant injuries you know in, in rowing the common injuries we pick up are you know rib stress fractures lumbar disc injuries and even hip problems but we're constantly analyzing the movement thinking what can i strengthen what muscle group can i strengthen can i get a better serratus anterior function to keep my scapula stuck to the rib cage can i ensure that you know i've got good um, range of motion through my anterior pelvic tilt so that I'm loading the correctly. So there's all these sorts of factors that we think about to ensure that our athletes don't get injured. I think that we can be thinking about things better from the health point of view in the sense that what are our patients and what are our people doing to ensure that they optimize their health and they stay healthy so they have many more um, happier, healthier years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, I, and it, I, I'm not aware of anybody that's kind of looking at it through that, uh, the lens that you've just described there. So that, that'll be really cool to see, um, as you present more and more material as it's coming out, um, how you're kind of, uh, passing that message along to the masses. Well, I think that, I think there are people out there, um, definitely doing great work like this and people much cleverer than me and they've got you know, better, better resumes than me and they've got bigger reach than I have. I think there's a lot of people out there doing good stuff. I think that the difficulty is that that message is important, but it's um, it's it's not heard, and the simply because of all the the noise that happens in society at the moment, like the noise of social media, the noise of these stories that I think don't really matter, um, but other people do. You know, the world of celebrity dominates the news. The um, the, the world of consumerism dominates the, the your Facebook feed, your Instagram feed. Um, so it's 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 a very hard message to get across because, like you've said before, the 
the warning signs or the um, the feedback is often not quite there. So how do people understand that this is one of the most important things that they'll ever have, their body, um, and staying alive, you know, 99.9% of us value that higher than anything else. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 it's trying to making sure in my head anyway, to try and marry those factors up with, um, with ensuring that everyone's day to day habits and day to day actions, um, are correlated to that. Right. Right. So is that, is that one of the things, um, that, you know, sparked you to start rowing wad? No, it's, and rowing was completely different. So, um, (laughs) rowing was completely different. So that's that's what I quite like doing um, from a sort of medical point of view, and that's where I'd like to my kind of, I guess, ten, twenty, thirty year goals lie in that in that space. Um, rowing what is a completely different start story and a completely different um, entity in itself. Really, um, I essentially finished rowing after the London twenty twelve Olympics. I came into back into medical school to finish my degree and, and, and embark on that medical career that I, I'd committed to when I started. And I essentially missed two, maybe three things. The first was that I missed the start line. So I missed competing. I missed that adrenaline surge of, you know, the countdown going, and then you can just put it all on the line. You're just focused intensely in that space. Um, There's nothing else that matters apart from the task that you're about to do. I missed that. Um, I also missed training for a purpose, if that makes sense. So I I, I missed having a goal to to work towards for so long of my life, so six years when I was 18, so you know, a third of my life was dedicated to trying to win an Olympic gold medal, and that was a very huge purpose uh, that gave me significance in my life, and I missed that. And I guess the third thing that I missed was the, the camaraderie of training. I really enjoy being around people and training as a group, and so I missed that camaraderie. And so uh, through a sort of few different coincidences, I just came into the world of CrossFit, and uh, this guy said to me, Hey, do you wanna do you wanna do this workout? It's called a wad. I was like, what is that? <laughs> and uh, and he was like, yeah, it's this thing. It's three rounds. Da, 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 da. And I think my first workout it was I think it was twenty one fifteen nine thrusters pull ups, which is called Fran. And um, and it sucked, and I was really slow. And uh, and I loved it because he was like, hey, well, we train down at this box. You can try this. And I and I started getting into the competitions. I ended up finding a CrossFit box in um, Twickenham, which was near to where I was, a place called Blitz CrossFit. The guys called Ben and Tim that started it. And I was hooked. And that's where I started my journey with CrossFit. And I'm, I still refer to myself and I still identify as being a CrossFitter today. That's how I train. Today, actually, I did I did the workout Murph as it's Memorial uh, Weekend. So did that one. If anyone doesn't know, mile run, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, then a mile run with a weighted vest. Um, all for the Navy SEAL that was that was fallen in Afghanistan. But yeah, so I, I'm a CrossFitter and I, I, I like doing that. And Rowing Ward essentially just was born out of an opportunity that came up about a couple months, not a couple months, a couple years after I started doing CrossFit. And there was a guy that was training a few athletes who just qualified for the games. And he said, hey, do you want to, I'm running this training camp and one of the components I'd like to include in the training camp is rowing because we've had some big rowing events before. And in my opinion, I don't think people can do it that well. And I was like, well, firstly, I agree with you. I think people can row better in CrossFit at the moment. Uh, And I'd love to help. I'd love to help as, as, as any way I can, really. And so there was two Brits and two Icelanders. And I went up to a gym. I ran a couple day training camp and realized, wow, there's, there's a hell of a lot of knowledge that these guys need that they're not doing, um, both from a rowing point of view, but also just in a kind of almost like a, a professional athlete setup. There's lots of performance indicators and performance gains that I'd taken for granted that we do in the Olympic rowing team um, that lots of people don't know about. So after that, I decided that what I needed to do was spread rowing knowledge to the CrossFit community. And I did that just by a website called Rowing Wad. Uh, I saw that the gymnastics wad existed, mobility wad existed, and I was like, well, rowing needs to have one because we haven't got one. Mm-hmm. So that's how, that's how Rowing Wad was started. It was, it was essentially th- through the, the vacuum left after the London Olympics where I came into CrossFit, the love of the CrossFit community and the fitness community, and then a complete coincidental opportunity that I spotted and thought, this is what we need. Wow, that's very cool. Very, very kind of, uh, again, it's almost like how you found the ore. It was sort of coincidental and then it very organically and quickly grew. Absolutely. And that's why I sort of describe myself as someone that 
just finds these opportunities or they, they arise, they excite me and then I just work hard to pursue them. I don't really think of myself as having one set career path that I'm going to be on for the next 30 years of my life. I have rough ideas, but I like to just pursue new things and to, to pursue opportunities that excite me. That's great. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that's very cool. Yeah. You're, you're leaving yourself wide open to whatever may, uh, come to you in life. We'll see. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Um, so in regards to, to rowing wad, um, yeah. so this thing is, really you know uh exploded uh since you yeah, started it crazy yeah um it was it was great and challenging in the same uh-huh. breath so i started it two months before i no, in fact it was a month before i um started full-time work as a doctor in the nhs so i put out the website it was just a free program for everyone and within two or three months we had a thousand people subscribed online um which baffled me and i was like wow this is not only does this justify my original hypothesis that there's a thirst for knowledge out there but secondly they like the, what we're doing you know like they like the workouts they like the community um this is cool let's keep doing this and i essentially just dedicated more and more time to it in this last year and i was ended up getting uh, getting up earlier and earlier in the morning and going to bed later and later in the evening to keep it going I end up using a lot of my days off and weekends to travel around, trying to work with as many people as possible. Um, and it's, it's grown phenomenally well, which I'm very proud of. Uh, we, we've got thousands of people that follow the programming. Um, I've been able to travel all over the world, which has been fantastic. I've met these amazing athletes, the people that won the CrossFit Games. Um, I've met Navy SEALs. I've met people in the British military. And it's just really cool that... I think that this knowledge of how to row, but how to also row for whoever you are, um, is getting out there. And the kind of mission statement behind rowing what is that I really believe that every human being is an athlete, similar to what I was talking about before with from the medical world. And I believe that every athlete should be rowing. And the reason I believe that is because I think running and cycling are these sort of movements we grow up with as kids. Um, but we really lose the ability to row in the sense that we don't grow up with this well many of us don't grow up with this movement and it's such a valuable movement for the human body that triple extension movement um hugely posterior chain dominant getting that hinging um sorted you can develop power strength and of course cardiovascular endurance it's great low impact it you know uses 84 percent of your musculature all that kind of cool stats but really for me the, the big thing is that it, it drives great rhythm and it when you master the rowing machine you master the movement, you also master that thing between your ears. Um, and so I think for me, it's such a powerful, a powerful movement and a powerful training methodology that I think more people need to be doing. Um, and so that's the mission behind rowing what is that what started in the world of CrossFit, I would like to grow into something that doesn't reach thousands of people, it reaches millions. Um, and so the, the, the goal with rowing what is to reach a million people. Because um, one of the things that I've I've realized is that I'm, I've got knowledge in the, the world of medicine and I guess in the world of sport and, and training and coaching. But if I'm going to really hit that goal of trying to reach lots of people and change their health um, with the non-communicable and lifestyle disease, my goal with that is to reach a billion people. I'm going to need to know how to grow organizations and to grow um, businesses as well. So I'm using rowing what almost as a kind of this opportunity again that's, that's arisen and it's grown quite nicely into an entity in itself where I can grow it to reach a million people so that that message is out there. A million people can have their, um, their training lives changed. And hopefully that knowledge that I acquire along that way will help springboard onto that huge, huge mission of trying to change a billion people's health. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that, that's very cool. And, uh, it's great to have, uh, to hear, uh, your kind of your, your long term uh, goals of, of hitting those those bench par- benchmark numbers um, and reaching more people and it, it, if you're hitting those numbers you're doing a great job of combating a lot of those uh, lifestyle uh, diseases that we're you know that we're dealing with today that are afflicting so many people. Yeah, and it's 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 an interesting one because. It's not through anyone's fault that people are getting these um, lifestyle diseases. It's not. It's not anyone's fault that their blood sugar is high and that they're you know, developing atheromatous plaques in their you know heart vessels. It's the fact that 
we are in a world that sells to us a lot and that wants us to consume. We're in a world where the food industry is sometimes not where it seems, what it seems to be. Um, and so I think there's a lot of knowledge that needs to be shared um, with the public so that people can make informed decisions about their own bodies. And that's one of the big challenges that I almost see a very nice parallel between you know, the world of health and actually the world of rowing is that you know this, rowing is actually very simple, but it's often overcomplicated. And so if I can deliver that message and deliver that coaching or that methodology to you know, millions of people, and we can have millions of people rowing and inheriting this new knowledge and this new way to help strengthen and to, you know, make their bodies much fitter, then in doing that, I should hopefully have a lot of knowledge gained to transfer the sort of same message, but in a different context to, to lots of people as well. So that's, that's kind of my mission, my, my sort of drive behind both of those. Um, but I just want to make rowing very cool and I want to make it accessible to many, many people. Um, because like I said before, I really do believe that every human is an athlete and, and every athlete should be rowing. That's outstanding. Outstanding. Um, so let's get a little bit more kind of granular into, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Row, rowing a lot. So, um, obviously, you know, you shared it was born, born out of, out of CrossFit. Mm. Um, so, you know, having had your experience as a high performance, um, you know, rower, um, how, how is that training? Is it similar? Uh, is it, you know, more of the roots, the foundations of rowing lot stem from, from CrossFit? Cause obviously the, the training you're doing, if you're, if you're training to go to the Olympics and, and compete and race the 2000 meter distance, it's going to be a lot different than what you would be doing in, in a CrossFit uh, type environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, so I'll, I guess I'll answer this a few different ways. The first is that um, training for the Olympic Games for rowing is very easy in a way. There is a 2000 meter race and you need to go from A to B as fast as you can. We know, <laughs> right. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. You, you know, we, uh, I mean, you know, you need to be fast on a 2K ergo. Um, that needs to be as fast as you can possibly go. You need to be very skilled in a, in a few different disciplines of boats. And it's pretty simple. There's, there's certain events and you need to be fast and you need to be faster than anyone else in the world. So in, in essence, it's quite simple. That's, that's the task. And once you have a task, it's very straightforward to program against that. I think the Great Britain rowing team is a fantastic example that it's more than just here's a task, right? Let's do some training. There's a huge, huge machine behind um, the team that ensures that we can do as much quality training as possible so that in that four-year Olympiad, the rowers that have gone through our setup have done more, and I'll put in sort of parentheses, more training than anyone else. And what I mean by more training is that we've done more volume and we've recovered better than anyone else. So your entire existence as an Olympic rower is around speed and that comes through different phases through the year, but it's all about being the fastest rowers possible. You know, if, there's a, if there's a kilo of muscle that you don't need, we don't have it. You know, we're, we're not very good at pressing overhead. Um, we're, we're not great at doing a few different things, but what we're very, very good at is moving a boat, and we're very good at horizontal triple extension and pulling huge, huge scores over the, you know, the 2K, the 5K. Um, and making that boat go very fast. So that's that's kind of Olympic rowing. What I would, what I've ch sort of tried to do with rowing wad is I first catered for the competitive cross for athlete. So you know the Greg Glassman mantra of constantly varied functional movements performed at high intensity. I really really like that uh, definition. Um, I guess the the two flags to plant are that there's the CrossFit methodology for everyday fitness, which is what I love doing. And it's what I think 99.9% .9 of people, well, maybe, maybe a bit less, maybe 99% of people in the world that do CrossFit do. At the same breath, there are the CrossFit games, which is, you know, using CrossFit's own marketing. It's the test to find the fittest on earth. And it's, again, constantly varied. There's an element to predictability to it, but there's always um, surprises. So, in essence, that programming for that test is very different and it's much more challenging in my opinion because there isn't a defined test. It's not like there are these 10 events or there are these 20 events. 
it's basically you've got to be good at everything, which I love. I really like that. So originally rowing wad was to um, focused at those competitive CrossFit athletes. So people that were trying to get to regionals, trying to get to the CrossFit games. And then there was a natural trickle down from that into people that were doing local competitions and all that. Um, and so the, the two big buckets that um, I first focused on with rowing wad were the mechanics of the movement to make people very efficient um, and the pacing. So how they could gear themselves using their rate, their length, their power to um, get the most out of themselves in any context. So, you know, in the, in the programming and also in the seminars, we talk about how to approach rowing workouts for fitness events, um, whether rowing's in all hopes of different, different kind of contexts. So that was the sort of first the first strand to rowing wad. What I realized through the growth of all of our subscribers was there's a, there was a huge demand actually, not necessarily for the competitive aspect to it, but for the personal you versus you, I wanna get better, I wanna have specific goals, um, and I wanna make myself better at rowing and I wanna be fitter. I wanna lose a bit of weight, I wanna um, you know, develop my aerobic capacity, I wanna develop my power. Everyone has their own little thing. Um, and so, I then came up with a different focus, which was like, right, well, can I create a program where people can have different entry points, you know, different fitness levels, different abilities, but they can kind of work through a program where um, they learn about themselves with pacing, they learn about the movement, and they create a solid base, a solid platform to then go on from that to go into which, whichever goal they want. Um, and so I, I developed a, a program which sits nicely in the website called the, the Fundamentals Program, and that's a sort of 40 session program where people can work through lots of different themes, there's different modules to it, and there's quite a clear linear progression. People can repeat workouts. Um, I took a bit of influence from, the, I guess, I'm not sure people have heard of the, the Headspace app, which is that kind of meditation app that guides you through, and there's some foundations there, and you can circle back on, on lessons. I sort of had that feel, that idea for, for that program. Um, and then the third thing that now Rowing World caters for, so those are those two buckets, the kind of competitive aspect, the um, what I would call fundamentals aspect. And then the third thing is trying to cater for everyone. Um, and what, what I say by that is I, I've created lots of different modular programs that are target um, specific. So if you want to get good at a 2K or a 500 or a 5K or whatever, we have something for you. If you want to just get good at rowing, let's say for calories or calories with a different movement, like calories and burpees or something like that, then you can pick that. Um, and so that's the sort of the three headed approach or the three sort of buckets of programming that exist on the rowing world website. Um, because I think it caters for the most people. Um, so that's, yeah, if essentially you're more competitive person that wants to do local competitions and regionals and even games, then you've got your beginner. And I put that in parentheses as, again, if people are still quite fit and very proficient as an athlete, but they haven't spent much time on the rowing machine, want to get more efficient, that's where they can go. And then also then we have this section called the engine room, um, which is essentially all these different programs and workouts that people can, can dive in and dive out of. Um, so, so that's how I segregate the rowing world programming. I would strongly suggest to anyone just to go and have a look and to pick out things that they like, because the most important thing with all this at a higher level is that they're just doing it often. So I like people to be rowing at least once or twice a week and just develop that habit. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you, you, the way that you've structured that, um, you have kind of those different, different, uh, demographics of those populations that you can really kind of hit on. Mm. Um, so mm. there's something for, for each group there, uh, and you're making it sort of very easy for them to enter into the, uh, rowing, rowing wide education kind of system. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really important that even though people are on different programs or different pathways, the goal is the same, which is just to become better at rowing and to become a bit fitter. And so we have a Facebook group as well called Rowing Wad um, that people come into and they can either choose to just gain inspiration or some motivation from other people posting their scores or they can ask questions. They can see what's going on um, in the world of Rowing Wad. Um, but most people post their Sorry, most people post their times and scores and ask a question or two, and it just, it's quite helpful to have that there as an extra bit of support. So it's really once you start a program, you kind of join the CrossFit community, kind of join the crew. Um, sorry, not CrossFit community, the, the Rowing World community. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's just nice to have lots of lots of people um, in that crew, if you like, that are contributing. Um, so, yeah, it's great. I see how you've you've 
created the the aspect of the camaraderie again that you that you really missed after uh, the the London games. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's no coincidence that you know we're human beings. We are meant to be in groups of people. Yeah. And I think that I certainly feel that I work better when I'm in a support system. So if I've got a a group of people that are helping me on, then I tend to do better. So yeah, we, I've tried to as best we can cater for that. Um, it's where I like to go and travel around and, and visit as many people as possible in different geographical areas to almost kind of plant these new communities that can pursue rowing and they can come back and, and stay in touch via by the power of social media and digital and the world of the internet at the moment. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Camaraderie is a huge component to it in the community. Excellent. So, so you just kind of hit on everything that's available, you know, online, but the other big yeah. piece that, um, you've really been ramping up in the last several months is the in-person live seminars. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that that was one of the things that I enjoy doing the most. Um, it was something that I couldn't do last year simply because of my medical training. So I was training full time as a doctor and I had maybe a dozen or so days off that I had to use to, to go and travel around. So this year I made the decision to step away from full time training for a year. So still doing some hours in hospital, still doing some shifts. I'm still keeping my practice going, um, but really not having that constriction to a full-time rotor so that I could go around and travel as many of these places as possible. So I've been all over the place, which has been great. I'm actually off to the US in June. So I'm over in uh, Boston, Vermont, and New York to give some seminars there. But I just find it really fun to go and train people and to go and share knowledge with people. And I found it very valuable because I think that I'm better at communicating in person, I think most people are, than I am with written word. And so I, it's just a more um, real way of instigating behavioral change in new communities of people. So, um, so yeah, people can check out the website, which is you know, www.rowingwad.co, and then forward slash events. And then there's a whole list of events there. Um, there's some in the US. We've just been to Sweden. Um, and then there's one in France later in the year as well, um, before we start the new cycle of, of seminars in August. So, yeah, loads of places for people to visit. Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I have uh, those links in the show notes for everybody to check those out. Um, Great. Thank you. Yeah. No, my pleasure. You're welcome. Um, that's that's fantastic. Teaching in person is, um, yeah. There's nothing quite like it. It's very it's very rewarding experience being in that type of environment. And also, nothing gets nothing gets confused, right? I mean, you can you can say something, and then the words that you say are directly um, <laughs> right. taken, and, and and people can understand the context. They can see you know the the tone. And if someone doesn't understand something or they take it out of context, they can ask and you can clear it up straight away. So there's, there's very little ambiguity in that. I love it. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, because, you know, when you when you put something out in written word or video or uh, social media post, it, it can be interpreted so many different ways. And then the intent or the meaning that the author originally had for that message can be can somehow, uh, you know, become completely misconstrued. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, well, fantastic. Is there, is there anything else that you want to touch on cam? Um, I think the, there's lots of things going on all the time. Um, one of the big things that I, um, I'm really looking forward to is we've just managed to get rowing wards, uh, classes actually into, into the commercial gym space. So um, what I mean by that is that I found new uh, big demographics of people that aren't actually in CrossFit gyms and aren't training at home. They're in they're in gyms and they have membership to lots of different fitness facilities all over the place. Um, and what I've realized is that a rowing mod class is quite a powerful thing. So I've had um, a few different CrossFit gyms that have tried this and now got into one one gym in London uh, with a few different sites. And it's, it's very fun to see people do rowing wide programming in a class environment um and so that's something that i think is developing all the time but that's quite an exciting almost fourth strand if you like to rowing wide so rather than these sort of bits of programming that live on the website and rather than in-person seminars and, and training camps it's this extra way to reach people which is through a, a rowing wide class so we, we're developing lots of different methodologies here 
uh, with that and having group fitness classes um, with the rowing methodology, philosophy and principles that, that's quite fun. And so far that's been, that's been received really nicely, which is great. Um, and yeah, I hope, hope that grows and yeah, just loving really all the little projects that I have going on at the moment. Um, it's just fun to disseminate knowledge to the community. Uh, as I was mentioning before this, this, um, call that we have, um, a CrossFit team called CrossFit JST, uh, which is trying to be the first, um, all British CrossFit team to get to the game. So I'm helping to coach that, which is great. So we're flying out to Madrid this week for the regionals. Um, so yeah, there's just always amazing stuff going on. And like I said, right at the beginning, that's, that's just how I think of, of what I like to do, which is find these opportunities. They come my way. And if it excites me, I'll do it and I'll work really hard to, to achieve that goal. Um, so that's what I do. Excellent. That's fantastic. Yeah. You're, you got quite the, uh, full schedule coming up, but it, it sounds all very fulfilling and rewarding work. Yeah, it is. And I think it's just fun to see other people getting better. So it's fun to get emails and posts and little messages saying, thank you very much. I've gone from this time to that time. Or <clears throat> thank you very much. I've, I've lost you know this amount of weight or I fulfilled this goal. It's just nice to you know, make a little difference in a very small way. And that's what addicted me to, to medicine. And it's what has now addicted me to coaching. So yeah, I love it. It's great. That's fantastic. Um, cool. so before I let you off the hook, the last, the last thing I do with, with yeah, any, uh, it. first time guest is I put them through uh, a series of rapid fire questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. I should have done some more research. Okay. It's, it's all right. Let's go for it. Jim. Um, Okay, so I'm not very good at rapid fire thinking. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll give my best go though. That's fine. I, I, no, it's all good fun. These are uh, I. These are the same questions I ask each guest. So these are just um, sort of for the audience to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, it doesn't have okay. anything to do with the, the topics uh, that we we already talked okay. about. Um, go for it. Okay, so Cam. So given all of your uh, expertise and your experience at this point in your life. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Don't worry. It will be fine. Um, it really, for me, the thing I've realized most is that people always talk about life being short. Life is very, very long. Um, there's a guy that I love to watch called Gary Vaynerchuk. He talks about patience. Um, I think the, the phrase I like to have at the top of my mind is just work smart and then be nice to people working hard comes before working smart. So work hard first, but then, you know, find that efficiency with working smart, be nice to people because that kindness has huge ROI. Um, but don't be in a rush. It's something that I try and keep myself grounded all the time, but patience is, is one of the most important things that allows you to have great long-term success. So yeah, my advice to my former self would be, don't worry, have few patience, keep your head down, um, work smart and be nice to people. Love it. Uh, if you had to pick one, What's your favorite strength training exercise? Ooh, strength training exercise. So one movement. Yes. Or, so I would go for bang for your buck. So I would call it the, the, so the cluster. So a clean into a thruster. You can go heavy or you can go light. Both are, you, we, can, we, can, we can change the rules, right? He, heavy and light. So it doesn't have to be one weight, one, just one movement, right? Sure, yeah. Cool. Yeah, the cluster. There you go. Clean, clean to thruster. Nice. Good touch. Yeah. What's your favorite training session to do? And that could just be on the uh, like rowing side or it could be a combination of rowing and uh, strength work. I like it. Very good. Um, on rowing, I like to keep it really simple. Um, I will do either some intervals with a fixed amount of rest, so 10 500s, 5 1Ks with a one-minute rest, or just pick a time domain and row as far as I can, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. So I, I like simple rowing workouts for rowing. So let's call it, you can give me one, so 30 minutes, row as far as you can. That's a really nice rowing workout. Um, on the strength and conditioning things side of things, um, I, I like to just do the basic basic strength exercise. I like to ensure that I am squatting and deadlifting and pressing. One workout, I'm trying to think, I, I really like chipper workouts. So I guess that to, if I could just do one, one strength and conditioning workout, one, one wad, if you like, it would be something along the lines of 50 cal row and then 50 of other movements, something like, um, some, yeah, 
push-ups, light squats, maybe some thrusters, maybe some box jumps, just a variety of things um, in a nice chipper format. I do like a chipper. Excellent. Um, here's a good one. How has your training changed today, present day, compared to 10 years ago? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> it's very different. <laughs> very different now. I used, to, I used to be able to – it was my job to train four to six hours a day. Um, now I try and still train as – often as I can. I, I try and um, I try and aim for at least one session a day still. So I look at training very differently now. I, I want to stay fit and stay strong and stay healthy. Um, I try and give myself an hour a day. So it's 4.1% of your day. And if you can't find an hour, um, even cumulatively throughout the day, then you need to just think about your priorities. So whether that's, you know, 15 minutes in the morning of just AMRAP of burpees, 15 minutes in the evening, push-ups and squats, you know, 30 minutes somewhere, just you can find an hour. Um, a very, very clever chap that I know likes to talk about um, working out is the business meeting with yourself that you never cancel. You just can't cancel it because the ROI of um, <laughs> the, the ROI of working out an hour a day, um, it just has huge, huge benefit. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky enough to, to be friends with lots of people that are very successful in all sorts of different walks of life. And the consistent thing that comes back is that they all um, have a physical practice, whether that's yoga, weightlifting, CrossFit, rowing. They do something. They move their bodies um, and aim for an hour a day. So, yeah, it's changed massively. One hour a day, I think most people can commit to. Yeah, that's so, so important. And I couldn't agree more about the uh, the huge ROI, not just from the – you know, the physical benefits in terms of, of health, but like, you know, behavior and, and mental, um, you know, productivity, Absolutely. whether it's, yeah, so yeah. huge, so huge. And I mean, uh, you, maybe your listeners and maybe yourself, you'll know a guy called Jocko Willink who talks about discipline, um, is freedom. Um, and he exercises or trains for an hour a day, often at like four in the morning or four thirty in the morning. Um, if Barack Obama, when he was president can do it, if Tony Robbins can do it, if Oprah Winfrey can do it, then bloody hell, like I'm sure everyone can. You know, right. these high flying CEOs who've got, you know, every minute of their day timetabled, leaders of the world got the everything timetabled, then people that have got, you know, regular jobs like you and I, well, maybe regular jobs, but then people have got like we're just, we're just sort of <laughs> normal, normal people, um, we can we can do it. Um so yeah, an hour a day. It's so important because it can define the rest of your day. And um yeah, as I say, the returns are massive. For sure. Absolutely. Um have you ever had an injury? And if so, how did that injury uh, change your training? Yeah, I've had loads. Um, so I fractured my ribs quite a lot um, through rowing. Uh, coincidentally, or interestingly, I don't get injuries anymore. I, I train either, if I start to get a niggle, I listen to my body a bit better. I'm still not very good at listening to my body when I get tired. I just sort of plow through. Um, but if I start to get a bit sore or twingy, I, I don't anymore. Um, Rowing is quite a safe exercise, so it tends, the injuries that we get tend to come with volume rather than an acute injury. Mm -hmm. But I used to get stress fractures because I have a, a short little body and very long legs. So just the way I row um, puts quite a lot of force through two or three uh, costal vertebral joints, and so sort of T8, T9, so sort of mid-back through my the joint between my spine and my rib. Yeah. Um, so I fractured the, my ribs a couple of times, but I, I was very lucky to be put through the, um, British Olympic associations intensive rehabilitation unit. Um, so I just was bomb proof after going through that process for eight weeks. Um, and I had, you know, all of these risk factors for, for rib stress fractures reduced to almost minimal. Um, and it, just a great testament to that system that exists is that, I never got on an, I think I've got on an ergo for, or a rowing machine for about less than 10,000 meters in two months, which is like, which is nothing for Olympic rowing. We do, you know, 180 to 200 K a week. Um, so to be on for 10 K in two months is, is nothing. I just spent all my time on the bike developing that aerobic capacity and then coming through that, um, rehabilitation process. And then a month after I came out of that process, I personal best my, or PB'd my, my 5k row so i got 15:33 which was almost 20 seconds quicker than i'd gone before just because i had a hugely efficient um bio um kinetic chain that was just performing really nicely wow that's so yeah i've got stress fractures but um through good prehab i don't get them anymore which is great 
So, um, just out of curiosity, what do you recall? Like specific uh, therapeutic um, exercises they had you do as you went through yeah, the, the uh, eight week program. Well, the fir- the first is to um, analyze what are the factors that are causing people to get an injury. So, for me, I had poor um, pelvic rockover, so I had pretty inflexible hamstrings. Um, I had quite poor shoulder um, function. So one of the things with rowing is that you want to make sure that your shoulder joint, which is quite, in, I mean, anatomically, it's very unstable. If you just think about the shoulder and the hip as a ball and a socket joint, the shoulder ball is very kind of far away from the socket, if that makes sense. So it, unlike your hip where you have your um, the acetabulum, the hip joint, like kind of the ball bit, and you have the head of the femur or your long bone, which is the kind of ball, um, sorry, the socket and then the ball. Um, if you have that, that's quite a, a nice loop. So you've got the ball that's stuck into this cup, if you like. It's quite well supported with, with bone to bone. Um, with the shoulder, the, the bony um, articulation or the connection is quite far away. So the, the cup or the socket is actually not that rounded. It's quite flat. Um, and then your head of your humerus or the upper arm bone, that ball bit, um, it's not really well in, encircled in all of this bone. So you have a lot of musculature around it that needs to um, stabilize that shoulder joint. Uh, mm-hmm. And then the extra extra bit of funkiness is that the uh, the shoulder blade, that scapula, then kind of rotates around your rib cage. So you've got basically got these like sort of, well, more than three, but like sort of loads of bones moving around each other. Um, so you need a lot of really well-organized musculature firing correctly to ensure that when you take a stroke, the force is dissipated nicely from hand to foot. So hands up into the shoulder, straight down the spine, straight through the hips, and then bang into that foot plate. If you have, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of people that have rib fractures and have a lot of injuries because they've got quite poor shoulder function as well. So their their serratus anterior is not strong enough to keep that scapula onto the rib cage. And so for me, that was um, that was one of the big factors. So we did a lot of work on my mobility, and then we did a hell of a lot of core stuff. So. I spent my two months on the Stott Pilates uh, reformer, uh, which is a brutal machine. I look like um, I look like someone that should have been at a, a kind of yoga class or, or doing all these sorts of like funny movements. That I thought it was a bit naff. I wanted to do some bench press, um, <laughs> but but actually after that two months of not turning, touching a barbell, um, I was the strongest I've ever been. So. I did these reformer movements, um, you know, Superman holds and all these different sort of lunges and. I uh, I then came out into the weight room having not t- not you know not touched a barbell and managed to like out front squat the entire team. So that was when I was like, oh, maybe this uh, Pilates reformery stuff is actually pretty good for me. So um, yeah, it was it was really just assessing what the risk factors were and then training to ensure that they were negated. Um, it's, I guess pretty simple when you think about it. No, that's great. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for for sharing that. That's right. Um, okay. Uh, what is one thing that you feel junior athletes, uh, should be doing more of to complement their training and their health? Junior athletes doing more of to complement training and health. So I'll, let me answer training and then health. So for training, uh, the biggest thing I think that junior athletes and I'll classify people that are juniors, like let's call it 16 and under, sure. um, I would think that they need to be doing lots of different sports. So there's a great book called um, The Sports Gene by David Epstein. And there's also a very clever book called The Talent Code. The author escapes my name. But um, my name or their name escapes my mind. Anyway, um, they, are, they, they, they talk about how these amazing sports people have lots of different skills. And you acquire these skills through variance. I think it's a bit of a common myth that people think, oh, I need to be really good at rowing. I'll start rowing from four. Or like I need to be really good. Maybe golf's an exception. I need to be good at you know I don't know American football or something NFL. I need to start and just just do that. Um, no, my my biggest advice would be to do everything. Just do archery, do water polo, go play soccer, play American football, play basketball. Just do what you love doing, what excites you. If you stop enjoying it, then hey, you don't have to do it. Um, just really experiment and stretch yourself all over the place. Um, there's so many skills to acquire out there in terms of movement um, that I think that the big mistake lots of youngsters make, I think, for, on an anecdotal level, is they spot their sports star, uh, a Ronaldo, a Messi, a Tom Brady, and they think, that's what I'm going to do, spend the rest of my life doing that. But no, variance is key. Um, so that's why I would say with training. Um, in terms of health, 
I mean, it's a it's a hard one, isn't it? Because I just don't think that I, I don't think that it's kids' responsibility to um, to ensure that they are being very very healthy. I mean, when you when you tell twelve year olds like go eat your vegetables. They're not going to eat their vegetables unless like people around them in their family are eating their vegetables or their role models are eating their vegetables. So, I mean, of course, we all kind of know what makes you healthy. Move, your, move the body um, and fuel your body correctly. You know, having whole foods, you know, good, um, good meat from good sources that are un- uncontaminated with all sorts of stuff we put in them. You know, great vegetables, all sorts of um you know, lovely food. There's a great book called, um, I forget the name, it was called Michael Pollan, uh, who I read. It's that, very, very interesting. Omnivore's Dilemma? Yeah, Omnivore's Dilemma. Perfect. Yeah, really, really good book. Um, but I mean, so I, I think for, if, if you're a young athlete, just eat well and move well. But also, I think the more important thing is be, put yourself in an environment that is supportive. So it's, I think it's more parents' responsibility and the responsibility of coaches and facilities to teach these young kids how to, um, how to move and fuel correctly. I think we take for granted the, the, the sort of health side of things. Um, we sort of don't think that athletes need to be healthy because you know, they're already healthy because they go fast, they, 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 they're strong and they're fit. No, 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 they need to be healthy. They need to be healthier than everyone, anyone else um, because you know, a healthy athlete is a really fast athlete. So, um, yeah, I, I would say getting young people into an environment that is supportive on a kind of biological, psychological level is, is, is huge. Um, and helping them to ensure that they fuel their bodies correctly is, is vital. Excellent. Um, what's your best tip to improve recovery post-training session? Sleep. Boom. Um, yeah, boom, job done. It's, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's something I don't do a lot of at the moment, but hey, short term at the moment. But um, yeah, I, people don't sleep enough in my in my eyes. When I was training the most, I was sleeping the most. Um, I used to try and aim for eight to nine hours at least in the evening, plus an afternoon nap. Now, okay, that was my full time job. I got paid to be a be an athlete, and so the whole day is set up for recovery, but. So many people invest hundreds of pounds of dollars a month in like, hey, this nitro way, extra hard, you know, branch chain, all these powders and potions. Yes, absolutely. If you are training at the maximum capacity, if you are optimizing your sleep, if you're getting you know, your compression going, if you're getting a massage every week, if you're doing everything, then you can look for all these different pills and potions, in my opinion. I think the biggest thing that people don't do is they do all this stuff and then they get four hours sleep a night and they wonder yeah. why they're under covered. Um, so, so yeah, sleep, invest in things like an eye mask, earplugs, um, get flux, which is a great app for your, um, uh, laptops or phones, fl.ux. It turns the um, UV light into in- infrared light. So your, your eyes don't think it's daylight. It's, um, it's kind of chilling out a bit more. Get a, get a daylight alarm clock that wakes you up gradually. Just those are the things that I would invest in sleep. Excellent. Uh, what's your favorite meal if you had to pick one? Oh, that's a really <laughs> good question. That's a really good question. I, uh, so my wife and I actually, so we, I would have to put it as, as roast chicken. So to give you a bit of a bit of sort of background, us British, we bloody love, we love a Sunday roast. We love a Sunday lunch in the UK is quite huge. Um, it's sort of just after midday, so maybe like one, two, three o'clock. You basically have like a big meal. Um, and for me, the easiest meat to cook is a, is a, is a chicken. Um, and my, my wife and I have now, cause we, do, we have to try and prioritize to see each other because even though we live in the same house, we sleep in the same bed, we're quite busy people. Um, and the easiest thing that goes to the wayside is, um, is day night or time together. So every week we order a, we order a roast chicken or we order a chicken and, a, and we have a roast, roast chicken dinner. So, um, I think my favorite meal from sentimental and taste, taste reasons is, is the roast and, uh, the roast chicken is my favorite. So that's how I'm going to answer that. Excellent. Chicken. I love it. Yeah. That sounds good too. Um, okay. Two more questions. Uh, yeah, what's, what's one book everyone should read? One book everyone should read. Ooh. And, and it can There's be any, loads. any genre. Yeah, I know. That's a tough one too. There's loads. Okay. I think, um, any genre. I think if you're, 
a great book that I read recently that I think is awesome if you're starting out your own business or if you just want to get more out of life is um, a book called Shoe Dog, um, which is the memoirs of Phil Knight, who created or co-founded Nike with Bill Bowerman. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great book. It's a it's a sort of not put downable read, in my opinion. Um, that is a that is essentially a sort of twenty to thirty year recall of how he started this little shoe company that is now the colossus that it is and how he got shafted along the way and had to do all sorts of things to protect his protect his dreams. So Shoe Dog is a book I could highly recommend. Um, I, I'm only allowed one, right? I'm going to mention this one. So there's a, there's a great biography um, of a guy called Elon Musk. Who yeah. Is, yeah. So he's, he's like essentially a cyborg. Um, he... He's created three companies that I think will change the world, uh, or they are changing the world. One is called SpaceX, the other is Tesla, and the other is um, Solar City. Yep. But his biography is is phenomenal. Just plotting his rise to fame. I mean, everyone's probably heard of PayPal. He helped create that and um, solve that. And he's just someone that I think is just the biggest thinker of our time. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if in twenty or thirty years we sort of. <laughs> we're living on mars and we have this chap to think so um sorry not think to thank but yeah so shoe dog if you're excited about it's an easy read very nice and if you want to think about you know what is possible in this world and if you're ever struggling about oh no everything with my life seems so stressful and so hard i don't know if i can do this read elon musk's biography and you can see what humans are really capable of Um, awesome yeah very cool thank you thank you for the recommendations that's all right all right final question yeah uh, who do you study or have you studied in your career to improve and get better? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, lots of people. It's not really one person. I constantly try and seek out people that are the leaders in their own field. Um, so uh, interesting, even though I'm sort of heavily with one foot in the sport camp, I tend not to read a lot about successful sports people. Cause I think I maybe arrogantly, I think I've got quite a good idea of how people get good at sport. Um, I, I, what excites me are how people really instigate huge change in populations of people. Um, so the people that I learn a lot from are people like Tim Ferriss, who is a guy that wrote the four hour work week for our body for our chef. And then recently something, um, called tools of Titans, but he essentially does what I sort of, I think the question is alluded to, which is that he looks at the world's best leaders, um, thinkers, CEOs, high achievers in all sorts of things. And just, tries to sort of deconstruct what they do. Um, so I essentially just dine out on his hard work and he sort of tells everyone how people do what they do. Um, so he's someone that I learn a lot from um, in his podcasts and in his writings and material that he puts out. So Tim Ferriss is definitely one. He's a successful person in his own right. He's got you know, New York Times best-selling books. He's got award-winning podcasts, all sorts of different things. And he's multiple successful angel investor in lots of different things. Um, another guy I love just because of his energy is a guy called Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, he, he talks about crushing it and about hustle, which is a, they're great things for me, but sometimes I have to take it with a a pinch of salt because otherwise I'll end up never sleeping and just constantly working for my entire life. Um, (laughs) so I have to sort of keep his advice at bay. Um, from a human kind of point of view and the thing I'm, I'm, I'm less good at, at the moment, I think I'm very good at just working hard and, and seeking out achievements. Um, a, a guy called Tony Robbins, who's a big sort of, uh, he would not like to be called a life coach, but he's sort of a, um, he's a huge influencer and, and really kind of taps into, I think his own phrase like taps into like the essence of people and essentially tries to take them from where they are to where they want to be. Um, he's a very interesting person that has done some fantastic things like reaching millions of people and raising huge funds for great causes um he always excites me whenever i see him talk or uh, read anything he's written um and then i sort of look at um i look at people that are leading big things so the likes of the oprah winfrey's of the world in media ellen degeneres um i look at people like bill gates and mark zuckerberg and people who've really built um things that are quite colossal and that have had huge impact on society um, and I try not to focus on like the macro level of, of what they did, like, Hey, they, they did, they did this thing, um, that caused Facebook to have this or had Microsoft to do that, or, you know, got this show here. I try and kind of polarize the spectrum. So I try to look at what they do on a micro level. So 
what's their morning like? How do they sleep? How do they divide up their working week? Um, and then right at the other end of the spectrum, what are they doing blue sky? Like, what is it that really excites them and gets them going? Um, you know, there's a guy called Simon Sinek that talks about starting with your why. Like, why are they doing this? Um, so, so yeah, a whole host of people, essentially. I, I don't really have one person that I look up to. I just really get excited when people that do exciting things are doing amazing things for, for people in the world. And I try and, I try and look at what they're doing at a micro level and also at a huge blue sky, higher level, um, because those are the two things that I think I can emulate, which is the day-to-day -day habits and the day-to-day -day tasks, but equally the big vision that drives everything. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. That's great. Yeah, I like, I like the um, tip about the micro level. I'm going to really work on taking a look at some of that stuff myself for me personally and try to see what I can adjust and fine-tune a little bit on that front. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it's something that I do and then just you know, go, go weeks without doing it. So it's like, I'm, oh, yeah, I should do this, this X, Y, and Z. And then I do X, Y, and Z for five days and then it drops off. But then I pick it up a bit later. And, and over time, I've just managed to acquire the habits that most resonate with me and that stick. You know, I, I pack my bag before the day, at the end of the day, ready for the next day. I wake up early. I work out early. You know, th those sorts of the habits that that stick tend to be the ones that fit most with your lifestyle. Um but no, I, I really get a kick out of seeing what these world leaders do on a micro level. It's quite, it's quite fun. Because at the end of the day, they all, they all, they all eat and poop, and they all, they're all human beings. But, uh, <laughs> but what are they doing that makes them, you know, create these fantastic things? Is it just right. luck, or is it, is it more than that? Yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, Cam, Cam this has been a uh, absolute blast. I'm so glad that we finally got to connect and and chat for yeah, uh, yes. for a little bit. So, um, no, equally, thank you very much for having me on. I mean, it's always great to talk to new people with new communities. Um, and like, I, I love, I love people that are doing their own thing and seeing your work is, is, is great. Um, I love that you love rowing, which is awesome. Um, but no, I'm, I'm happy to chat and, and make some time. So no, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. You're quite welcome. Yeah. Just hang on the line. Let me give you a proper goodbye off air. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed that brand new episode of the Leo training podcast. If you value this content, please take a moment of your time, head on over to iTunes and drop in a five-star review. Or, even better, take a moment and share it on your favorite social media networks such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram. And be sure to tune in next week when I have another brand new episode and I sit down with Dr. Emily Splickle of the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy and we talk about the foot biomechanics as well as barefoot training. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.